room this morning. Listen, you may not fully understand those words, but when we say that Jesus has overcome, we're not just saying, oh, look, that guy has been successful, right? There's so many people that we know of, that we read about in the news, and we look at them and we say, that's great for them, but it doesn't affect me. See, but because Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death, that means that we also can defeat Satan, sin, and death through our faith in him. And it's only through him that that's possible. And so let's, uh, let's, let's lift our hands up right now if you could. It's only awkward if you don't do it now because now you're the only one who's not doing it. And let's just pray together and just lift our hands and praise to you. So Jesus, we come to you right now and we just thank you for the opportunity to gather here and worship this morning, God. And I pray that we would truly worship, God. God, help us to drop the facade and to drop the walls, God, that are blocking things out because what, we, what we're doing when we keep those up, when we worry about our image and we worry about how our appearance is, what happens is we actually block you out too. God, I pray that you would help us to be honest with ourselves this morning. I pray that you would help us to be honest with each other this morning. I pray that, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would move in us and that this wouldn't be just another Sunday, just another day of the week but Lord, that you would show up in a mighty way. That the movement of your spirit would be evident to everybody, that nobody in this room would harden themselves against what you're trying to do in their lives. Convince each and every one of us that if what you're moving us toward is different from the direction we wanted to go, that we wanna walk your path instead of our own because we can be confident, not only that you are good and that you wanna lead us down the path to good things, but that you know better than us. God, I pray that you would just work in this room today, not just in this room, but in, in, in the room, in the minds and the hearts of everybody who's listening online. God, I pray that you would just touch many, many lives, that you would save us today, that you would guide us in the right direction, that you would convict us of our sin, that you would lead us to repentance and help us to see you for who you really are. I pray for the sick and the hurting in our congregation and those who couldn't be here today. God, I ask for healing for them, that you would bless them and encourage them because I know some of them are really discouraged. I pray that you would comfort them in their time of weakness and give them endurance to make it through. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, why don't you guys say hi to a couple people around you? Give them a fist bump. Give them a high five. Give them a hug. <laughs> you got a cute smile, Jonathan. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> all right, what's up, everybody? My name's Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here. We're shaking things up. If uh, you've been here before, things are a little bit different today. Obviously, I'm out here way earlier than normal, and there's two reasons we're doing that. One is because variety is the spice of life. That's the first reason. And uh, as a staff, you know, sometimes we look at it, we're like, okay, what are we doing this week? Well, we're gonna have these many, this many songs and this announcement, blah, blah, blah. But we're not gonna do that this week. We're just gonna shake it up a little bit. Um, I, I wanna welcome you, especially if you're a first time guest here today. If you've never been here before, we're so excited that you're here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later on toward the end of the sermon about um, uh, basically uh, how you can get a gift from us, because we do have a gift for you just for coming today. We're excited that you're here, and we'll also talk about giving a little bit later on as well, but um, I'm really pumped to get into this message today. Um, we're doing David and Goliath today, and I'm excited about that. This is like uh, this is like Monday night football for an NFL team. Like, this is the showcase moment, right? This is the big, exciting thing, and so I'm excited about that, but before I do, um, I want to take a moment to talk about something that's coming, something that God has been like just nagging me about for months now that's coming for our church um, and he's put this vision in my heart for it and so um, what's happened is over the course of the last year I've had multiple people come to me on a one-on-one -on -one basis and say a couple different things one they've said things like I feel like I'm disconnected from the other people in our church and this isn't just people who aren't serving this isn't some some of us don't really try and then we complain that we're not connected. But others of us, we're, we're trying and we're not connected. 
and, and I've had people approach me about this, and they're like, I just feel the need, like, to, to beyond Sunday, to connect with people. Like, Sunday, it's a lot of five-minute conversations. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. Five minutes later, you're on to the next person, and so on and so forth. But you can't develop relationships like that. And then I've had other people come up to me, and literally, this, and it's a shame they even have to do this, but they literally come up to me and say, I want to learn how to read the Bible. I need a Bible study. I need this. I need your help. And it's like, we have, fortunately, we have the blocks, have, have continued a Bible study on Sunday nights uh, for, for the last year, even when we haven't had other group options available. And we've had um, Celebrate Recovery on Tuesday night for people who are in recovery and, and people who need help. But we haven't had a whole lot else going. And it's just this huge thing that God has placed in my heart that it's time for us to get back to connecting with each other outside of Sunday mornings. That, that if we're going to have a faith that's deeper than a one-day-a-week meal that we come and feast and try to gorge ourselves and hope it lasts us the rest of the week, that we're going to have to be like the church in the book of Acts, and we're going to have to meet together and have everything in common and care for one another. And so what that looks like is basically these connect groups. And we're going to be starting them back up, and we're going to be tweaking them and changing them from how they used to be. But basically what they involve is, is three main things. First of all, fellowship, which basically means that we have believers getting together with other believers and growing together. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. In other words, if you're a lone wolf Christian, guess what? You are not going to be growing at the click that you're able to if you were able to be in a group of people who's also growing with you. Plain and simple. It's not going to happen. And the other thing is the fact that, um, that in a group we can care for each other, that, that we have I don't know if you know this, if we had everybody here on a Sunday, we'd probably have around 200 people consistently here. If, if everybody was sick and not on vacation, about 200 people every, every single week. I can't care for 200 people. Me and the other pastors, there's only two of us so far, or, or three of us total so far. We can't care for 200 people. So guess what? You have a responsibility to care for one another. That, that, like, that's not my job, is to care for everybody. And so if somebody's sick and in the hospital, they're not going to fall through the cracks and go unnoticed because somebody in your group's going to be like, hey, this person's been missing. There's only eight of us. It's easy to find out when there's one missing, right? And then the other thing is just simply the Bible study aspect. Not all of our groups are going to be Bible studies, but every single group will have an aspect of Scripture to them, right? Because that's the way that we get to know God. And so basically, I tell you all this because I believe in my heart that the thing that is going to literally propel this church into reaching more and more and more and more people and also growing deeper and deeper and deeper in our faith as well, I believe that connect groups are going to be that thing. I believe they're the missing component. And so if you're sitting here and as I'm talking about this, um, you know, I, I, I would hope that the Holy Spirit would be stirring in your heart. I've been praying for these for months. Um, that, that he would be stirring in your heart your desire to at least be a part of one. But beyond that, what we need to start with is we need to find and identify some people who are interested in, in leading one. Or if not leading one, if you don't feel comfortable with that, maybe hosting one at your home. And they'll all look very different. Some of them will sit down and study the Bible. Some of them will, um, you know, maybe they'll, we'll have like a crafting group or maybe we'll have a group that likes to, you know, ride bikes or work out at the gym together and then pray and talk with each other. They could look very, very different. Maybe God's putting something on your heart even now, but I want you to know that we're going to try to start these in early October. And so if you're interested in leading or hosting, you need to go to Connect Central after um, we're done here and you can just let them know that you're interested we'll take down your name and number it's not a commitment we just want to talk to you about it so um that's my sales pitch god has put that heavy on my heart but now let's get straight into the message today so david and goliath i want to start with the obvious goliath in the story that we're going to read today pretty much everybody knows this story if, if you've been a, a child in america most people know the story of david and goliath or they at least know it's about a giant versus someone small. And the thing that I want to point out right off the get-go about David and Goliath is that Goliath is not just a person that David overcame, but he is a symbol or a metaphor of the obstacles that we face in our lives that are too great for us to handle. And if you're not facing one of those now, you probably have in the past, and you certainly will in the future. And there are the, just these things that are just too big for us. It's, 
It's the call from your doctor that, that says that the diagnosis is not what you were hoping for. It's, it's, it's when the spouse comes up to you and says, I just don't know if I'm in love with you anymore. It's when your kid says, I'm going to go my own way and do this thing that I know is harmful to me, that I know will break your heart, but I'm going to do it anyway. It, it's, when, it's when money is so tight and you're wondering if you're going to have a place to live next month. It's these big things that are difficult to overcome, but I want you to understand that as a pastor, when I, when I have conversations with people throughout the week, and it seems like it's every day sometimes, what I've discovered is that the greatest giants in our lives are not the things that are happening out here, it's the things that are happening in here. That when people feel most defeated in their lives, it's not by what's going on in their external circumstances and the problems that they face, it's the fear and the anxiety and the depression, and the complacency, and the temptations, and the worry, and all of these things that are inside of us that we hide and we mask so well, but really on the inside we're struggling, and if we're honest, for many of us, we're losing the battle to them. We're intimidated by them, and we don't know where to turn, and we don't know what to do. And that's really what the story of David and Goliath is really all about. One of the crazy things that I think about these giants, and, and it, I'll show you in David's life how it's true, is that um, these giants, you're not encountering them by accident. That it's actually part of God's plan. This is, this is not a comfortable statement. That for, for many of us, it is not a part of God's plan that we would encounter things that are bigger than us. Okay? So in David's story, if you were here last week, you remember, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to wake you guys up. Can everybody just give me a head nod and say, I'm awake, I'm awake. All right, cool, cool. All right, it's fine. No. Gosh, I got I don't know. I'm going to get a, a hose or something up here and just like let you guys have it in the middle of service. But here, I, sorry, I'm getting off track a little bit. Um, so, so, so the giants that we face in our lives are things that God has actually allowed to come into our life for a reason. And for David, if you'll remember last week, we talked about the fact that when he was anointed as the king of Israel, there was still a king on the throne. His name was Saul. And so David was anointed as king by God in this little private ceremony, but Saul, in, in everybody else's eyes, was still the king of Israel. And so he's still sitting on his throne. Nobody knows who David is, but guess what? God knows who David is. Some of you, nobody knows who you are, and you feel like nobody cares about you, but guess what? God knows who you are, right? And so, so, so like, David is a nobody. And, and, and he's just sitting there, and he's hanging out with the sheep still, and he's wondering, when do I get my crown? When do I get my robe? When do I get my throne? He would actually go on to wait years and years before he would become king, but guess what? God put this giant in front of Israel and this giant in front of David specifically so that David could come to the forefront of what everybody was seeing. and could, They could see him as more than what other people had seen him in the past. He wasn't just the youngest brother in a poor family that come from a shepherding town in Bethlehem. He had the heart of a king, and it would all become uh, apparent to everybody in this battle with David. And listen, the giants that you face, I believe, serve a similar purpose. I believe that God has a, a, a good plan for the bad things that happen in your life. And specifically, specifically, that God wants you to see that the things that are bigger than you, he's bigger than them. That's his specific thing, that he would get glory out of the fact that, that the things that are bigger than you, he is even bigger than them. And he wants to make that apparent in your life. And he wants to see and to test you to see if you are willing to fully trust him in those moments. If you will allow him to do the work that he can only do, that you can't manipulate your way out of, you can't, out, you can't smart yourself out of, you can't pay enough to get out of. But, but he will, you, you will trust in him and you will wait on him to actually rescue you from the situation. He wants to know if you will do that. And so when we think of the story of David and Goliath, we tend to think of it as a story about big versus little, but it's not a story about that at all. It's a story, it's not a story about size, it's a story about trust. That's it. 
plain and simple. And so we're going to kind of tease that out today, okay? So let me, I'm going to summarize a lot of it because it's kind of long, but it starts off with the Israelite army, God's people, including King Saul, lined up on this mountain to face off with their enemies, the Philistines, who are lined up on an opposite mountain uh, preparing for battle. And we actually have a picture. Um, They did this in a place called the Valley of Elah. It helps to kind of keep into perspective the fact that these are real places and real people. And so um, I think we have the picture coming up. I'm getting the finger. Not that finger. This finger. The hold on a minute. The hold on a minute. <laughs> that computer guy's a jerk, man. He is He's really mean. We'll, we'll give it one second. You guys all thought bad things were going on here. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep talking while this is going on, and then you can pull it up whenever it's time. But um, So basically, while they're lined up on these two mountains, you'll see there's this, there's this valley, and it's not, it doesn't just come to like a point at the bottom. There's this big open space at the bottom of these two mountains, and so the plan is, obviously, if you're an army uh, that, that's fighting with swords and spears, you're going to, there it is. So um, I'm not sure exactly which mountain which army was on, but, but you see how it's kind of set up. You've got these, these hills or these mountains, and, and the, the kings would take the high ground, and they would face off on opposing mountains, and there was all this space in between where whenever it was finally time to rush into battle, they could rush into battle and fight each other on flat ground, flat footing. But if they needed to retreat, they could go back up their mountain and would have the high ground. And so, so this, is, this is literally the place where David fought Goliath, okay? And so... So what happens is after they're all lined up and they've drawn the battle lines and they're ready to fight, out of the Philistine camp comes this this guy, this monster named Goliath, who the Bible describes as being nine feet tall. For a little perspective, I'm about six foot. This stage is about three feet. This is how tall Goliath was. Only not as scrawny as me, you know what I mean? Like, he's a big dude. In fact, he was so big, um, he was covered with armor from head to toe, bronze armor from head to toe. And just his chain mail, just the stuff he wore over his torso, weighed 125 pounds. He was a monster. His spear, which people have recreated based on the description in the Bible, was about almost as thick as a baseball bat and as tall as a lamppost. It was huge. The end of it alone was 15 pounds of iron formed into a tip. Uh, I actually saw a a replica of the tip of Goliath's spear. I don't know why they did this, but they set it next to a baby. It was bigger than the baby. It was insane. And so this dude is just freakishly huge, and he comes out to face the Israelites, and this is what he says. This is 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 8. It says, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. In fact, not only were they terrified, but they were paralyzed by their fear into doing nothing. Because that day, nobody came out to fight Goliath. So the next morning, Goliath came out again. And again, he taunted them again. And that happened the next day, and the next day, and the next day, until a month passed. And it kept going the next day and the next day until 40 days had gone by and nobody was man enough or trusted God enough to step up and to actually fight Goliath. And what I think is so fascinating about what Goliath says there, first of all, we we forget the fact that even though Goliath was a big man, we forget that he was also a big mouth, right? Because he's using... He's using intimidation to put fear into these people. He's showing off, and he's sort of strutting around in his armor, and he's talking smack and taunting the armies of Israel. And it's kind of like um, 
what like MMA fighters and boxers do whenever they're squaring off with each other at weigh-ins or before the fight. Like Mike Tyson used to say that when he was getting ready to fight someone, that he would stare him down and he would do his thing while the ref's giving instructions. And he said the moment that his opponent looked away, he said, I knew in that very moment that I had already won because they were beaten here and they were beaten here before they ever threw any fists. That's what Goliath's doing. He's trying to intimidate them and strip them of their confidence. And the way he does it, for, for being a, a guy who you would kind of expect to be just sort of a big dum-dum who's like, you know, lumbering around and killing people all the time, he does it in a surprisingly tactful way because what he says, if you didn't catch it, is, I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. doesn't say servants of God does he? He says, you are only servants of Saul. And he correctly identifies the source of their confidence. Because if you will remember, I think I mentioned it last week, that that the Israelites had basically turned their back on God. God was like, I am your only king. And they're like, no, we we want a king that we can see. And so they had turned their back on God, and they had put their trust and their confidence in Saul. And the problem then comes when the thing that you're facing is greater than the thing you've put your confidence in. And we do this all the time. We put, our, we put our trust, our confidence in ourselves, in our abilities, in our looks, in our intelligence, in the things that we have to get ourselves out of the problem. But what happens when it's just not enough? We, we, put, our, we put our trust and our confidence in our money and our possessions, and we think if I just get more, then I'll be secure. But as we all know, there are things that money can simply not buy. And there are situations money can simply not buy your way out of. We put our trust sometimes in other people and friends and family relationships. And when we, when we put all of our eggs in that basket for them to protect and to provide for us, what happens when they either disappear or they're faced with something that's too great for them? And this is exactly why we must put our trust in Jesus alone. That he is the only one who can supply us with endless rivers of strength and endurance to overcome what needs to be overcome in our lives. And and see, the thing is, not always will God provide you with strength to overcome a giant in your life. It's not always like David and Goliath where you have to like fight and you have to get in there and you have to win. Sometimes he's just going to give you strength to outlast your giants, to survive through it, to have enough endurance to make it through the current situation so that you can, you can move to the other side and at the end of it point back and say, I did not have enough strength in myself to make it through that on my own. That there was a God who was with me every step of the way and he supplied the strength that I needed to get through. Here's the lesson we have to take away from this. You are only as strong as the person you most trust. That's it. You are only as strong as the person you most trust. If it's yourself, then guess what? When you, when you encounter a giant that's bigger than you, you're, you're not going to be lacking. You're not going to have enough. But when you put your trust in Jesus, there's no end to what he can provide you with. I want to give you a, a word of caution here because I think there's a mistake in the Christian community today where we see confident people and we assume that they're arrogant people. And I want to tell you that it's a mistake to assume that because I believe, based on what I see in the scriptures, that Christians should be the most confident people on the face of the earth. And here's why. Let me explain. So so confidence is to believe. Arrogance is to belittle. And so Goliath came out, and he's beating his chest, and he's talking all kinds of smack and showing off, and he's looking down on everybody. And saying, you're not as good as me. Bring it on, baby. But remember, David at this point is nothing and nobody. And we're going to see that yet he still believed that God could conquer this thing for him. That God, through him, could defeat this giant. And so, so I want you to know that if, if you're walking around with a lack of confidence, man, I just maybe you're putting your trust in the wrong thing. But don't think that having no confidence is like some kind of noble Christian trait. Because it's not. Because our God is so loving and so good and so strong that we should be the most confident people in the world, hands down. It it should be just oozing out of us all the time. 
So, so if you're really struggling with confidence, I encourage you to turn to Jesus, to turn to him, and hopefully this story will help you uh, a little bit more too. So moving forward in the story, there's this 40 days of taunting, and during this 40 days, David's older brothers, his three oldest brothers, are literally suited up and ready to fight, and they're on the front lines. And so David, who's been back with the sheep during this whole time, his dad comes to him and he says, hey, David, I want you to go and I want you to take some food out to the battle for your brothers and for the other soldiers. And I want you to come back with a report of how your brothers are doing. And so David does what his father asks. He leaves uh, the sheep with another shepherd and he takes this stuff and he goes to the front lines where, where everything's going down. And he arrives basically in the morning when all the troops are waking up and they're going out to, to form their battle lines and basically to start the whole process that they've been going through all over again. And so David arrives, and he's talking with his brothers. And while he's talking with his brothers, this giant comes out of his tent and starts his taunt. And this is what happens next. Verse 24. It says, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Where are my poor single guys at? You know what I'm saying? Like a wife and no taxes. All right, let's go. This is awesome. Tax-free, baby. Verse 26, David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? So David's asking the question they already answered. But then he asks a follow-up question, which is more insightful. He says, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Like, you just feel the, like, he goes from, oh, what's the reward, to wait a minute. Why is this even a question? And we learn two big things from this conversation David has. First of all, we learn that David sees the situation different from the way other people see it. See, see David comes out and, 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 and he's talking to the other soldiers. And again, these are God's people, right? They're supposed to be God's people who are living in faith and fighting in faith. And, and, and when they come out, they say, did you see the giant? But David doesn't say, who is this giant? He says, who is this pagan Philistine? In other words, the way you can interpret that is, who is this guy who is just like every other one of God's enemies? It makes no difference to God how big he is. He's just like the rest of them. So why are we intimidated? And then the other soldiers, they also say, you know, he comes out every day and he defies Israel. But David says, no, 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 he doesn't just defy Israel. He defies the armies of the living God. And he's just, like, you can just sense the frustration and the anger. And, and, and the reason he sees things different from everybody else is because he's looking at the situation through the filter of faith. That, that there is a filter over his eyes that all the time he's spent in the fields with the sheep and, and learning to be faithful to God and faith-filled toward God, he suddenly sees things different than the way other people see them. And, and the best way I can kind of explain what this looks like is through uh, technology. So um, there's this technology that came out a few years ago, and it's called augmented reality. And some of you may be familiar with the term, but you've certainly seen the results of it. Augmented reality is something that's used on a lot of games, um, and it's used on Snapchat. So whenever you see the girls that have dog ears and makeup on and dog noses, really weird, by the way, um, you're seeing augmented reality. And basically what it means is you have reality, so you're seeing the person, but through their phone, there's a filter on that allows us to change what looks like reality. Okay, you tracking with me? So another example is this. We have a picture of a game that was really popular like two years ago for about a minute. It's called Pokemon Go. And if you're not familiar with it, that one week last year where all the nerds came out of the hiding and they were all outside, that was that game. I was one of them, all right? I speak as one of the nerds that played the game. I was the guy walking around the park catching Pokemon, right? And so, so like, this is what it does, though. Basically, you see the, your real-life background, but you also see something that nobody else sees. 
And so David's walking out, you know, he's, he's uh, doing his thing, and, and he comes out with his food and gives it, and he's going to see his brothers, and he comes out, and he sees Goliath come out and start taunting, and he brings out his iPhone, and he holds it up, and he looks at him, and it's an iPhone 6 because he's a poor shepherd. He can't afford the iPhone X, but he doesn't care because he gets to still play. And so he comes out, and he, and he holds it up, and, he, and he's looking, and he's looking through this filter, and, 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 and everybody else is looking at Goliath, and what they see is a pit bull just ferocious and just like just ready to take people down and they're all scared and they're shaking in their boots but 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 David holds up his his little phone and he opens Snapchat and he flips to the the faith filter you know what I mean he, he flips, yeah don't judge me uh he, he flips to the faith filter and he looks and when he sees Goliath through the faith filter he doesn't see a pit bull he sees a peacock a glorified turkey that's spreading its feathers and trying to make itself to be something bigger than it really is you know what I'm saying? I'm not diminishing the fact that Goliath was a, a strong dude who had killed many people. He'd been a warrior since his youth, as we'll find out later. He was, he was the real deal, as long as you don't have any extra power. But David had God on his side, and he trusted God. That's the key thing. It wasn't just that he had God on his side. It's that he trusted God. And so when he looked through that lens of trust, he said, this guy's nothing. He's chump change. Let's do this. <laughs> I love it. David's all fired up, man. So am I already just talking about it. But, but when you look through the filter of faith, there's a couple of things that happen. First of all, the big problems in your life start to seem a lot smaller because you're not comparing them to yourself. You're comparing them to your God. So they just shrink, shrink, shrink until they're almost nothing. Another thing that happens, though, that's kind of surprising and opposite is that things that seem insignificant actually become of greater importance. So, for example, when a man comes to faith in Jesus and he realizes that he spent his whole life working and no time with his family at all, all of a sudden the thing that seemed least important started to grow in significance in his heart, right? That happens a lot. And then, of course, when you're looking through the faith filter, you realize that God is working in the, back, the background. Like, nobody else can see it, but you just know he's there. And you may not know how, but you just know he's there doing something, that he's moving. So that's the first thing we get from his conversation. But the second thing is this, is that what David wanted above all else was to glorify God, was to, like, to make God famous. Because what you see in his words is you see that he's interested in learning about the reward. He inquires about the reward. He, he cares about the people of Israel, but he is motivated most deeply in his heart by making sure that God gets the glory that he deserves. And, and it makes me wonder when we see his frustration, what he is most frustrated with. Because many of us would look at the story and say, man, he's frustrated with Goliath because Goliath's talking smack and he's talking smack about Israel. But I wonder if David is most frustrated with the fact that you have thousands upon thousands of God's people who are paralyzed by fear instead of walking forward in faith. That at any given moment, any one of those men that were on the front line should have stepped forward in faith and said, my God is bigger than you and could have done the same thing he did. And he's a little shepherd boy who's coming and not even supposed to be in the battle. And he's the only one who has the courage and the trust to step up. And it just makes me wonder, like how many of us here today are, are, are the, the people who are you know, we've got the Christian name tag, and, and we're listening to the fish, and, and, and we're reading our Bibles, and we're doing all this stuff, and we've got the, the Israelite armor, we look good, and, and we're doing the thing, and we look the part, but we're afraid to step forward in faith, to, to, to confront and to challenge the things that God has placed in our life, and instead we're shaken in fear, and we're afraid to take, take that step, whatever it may be. Maybe it's into a new ministry. Maybe you finally need to go see the doctor about that thing you've been avoiding because you're afraid of the result. I don't know what it is for you, but I believe that there's people in this room who have been waiting to take a step because they've been afraid, but I want you, it's, I want you to know it's time to take a step of faith. That I don't want to be a church where we're all sitting on our hands and waiting for someone else to step up and do the things that God has called us to do, because we've all got stuff to do. So he's uh, incensed, he's angry, at what's going on, um, but he continues to ask about this reward, uh, what he will get for killing Goliath, and, 
Um, I think mostly probably just to clarify that it's true because like, he can't look it up on Google or anything, right? So he needs to talk to a couple people and make sure that like, he understands what, what the consequences of him going out there and winning this fight will be, even though he's confident in what God will do. And so word gets around and finally reaches the king, King Saul, that David uh, is, is asking questions about the reward. He's like, maybe we have a taker, you know? And so he gets all excited. He invites David uh, to come and talk to him. And uh, this is how that conversation plays out, starting in verse 32. It says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Everybody's out to to discourage David from doing what God has called him to do. And I want you to know that people are going to do the same thing in your life. We skipped over it because of time constraints today, but right before this incident, um, David's older brother criticized him for even asking about what he would get for killing Goliath and basically said, shouldn't you be with the sheep, little boy? The person, One of the people who's closest to him in his life is just pushing him aside. Saul's pushing him aside. Everybody's telling him, you don't belong here because you don't look the part. You don't, you know, you don't have the experience. You're not the right age, whatever the case may be. Everybody's just pushing him aside, pushing him aside, pushing him aside. And they've all given up on him before anything's even started. And here's the crazy thing. David's the only one, even though he's called a little boy, he's the only one who's acting like a real man out of the entire nation. In fact, Saul was, uh, as we talked about last week, not just the best-looking dude in Israel. He was the tallest. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. So if anybody was not being a man who was neglecting what he was supposed to do, his responsibility as a king and a warrior, it was him. He was the, he was the closest thing that should have been, like the closest thing to Goliath's size. He should have been the warrior who should have been in there, and he dares to call David a little boy. Now, this is just a little rabbit trail real quick, but I want you to know, I read this in a commentary this week, and it's so good, that, that just because people hurt you with their words doesn't mean they should hinder you with their words. They don't, they don't have the authority to stop what God is doing in your life. They don't have that authority unless you give it to them. And so don't give it to them. Let their words hurt. So what? It's going to happen. If you're pursuing God, it's going to happen. Just let, let them hurt and move on. But, but David is, is so much more than only a boy. There's this book that a couple of us guys read a, a few years ago. It's called Wild at Heart, and uh, it's by John Eldridge. And he put this quote in there just, like, ingrained itself in my brain. It says this. It says, a man is never more a man than when he embraced, embraces adventure beyond his control or when he walks into a battle he isn't sure of winning. I thought, oh, man, that's so good. And David, you know, he's got this confidence, but everybody else looks at him, and not only do they think, you know, it's not sure whether he's win, they, they're pretty sure he won't. But David knows something that they don't, and, and here's uh, how the rest of his conversation with Saul goes. Verse 34, but David persisted. He says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And look at this. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. See, I love this. I love this. And and here's one of the things that we can draw from this. One of the things that we can draw from this is is that the problems that you endure in private are, are preparation for public victories that God wants to give you down the road. That, that I've seen it so many times among Christians where, where God will save somebody out of an addiction or out of some kind of sin or out of some kind of difficulty, and then he will use that later on to give them a platform to speak to other people who are struggling with that same thing, right? And it happens all the time. And so as you're struggling with stuff, it's so tempting to just want to avoid it or get out of it or take a shortcut or disobey God to escape it. 
but I want to challenge you to stay in it and trust God through it because he wants to do something in your life through that. He's preparing you for something through that. But I want you to know that if you're going to pass those tests, if you're going to make it through those things, that it is not enough to be tough. That you have to be intimate with God. Intimate with God. Here's the thing. We as Christians tend, and Israel did this too, we have a tendency to only be dependent on God when we are desperate and in need of deliverance. And as soon as he makes everything right, we tend to go our own way and say, thanks God, I can take it from here. Things are good now. And then the second another problem comes along, we run right back. But listen, God wants you to trust him and to follow him and submit to him and grow intimately with him in your daily life. Which means if you're not spending that time in prayer and connecting with him and learning who he is by, by reading the word or participating in a Bible study or whatever it may be, whatever, whatever that process looks like, if you're not doing those things, then you're going to find yourself unarmed and ill-equipped when the moments that those giants enter your life. You're going to find yourself unprepared. And the time of preparation is not when the battle shows up. It's way, 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 way beforehand. And I guarantee you when David's out in the fields, he's not just out there. He's not just out there like chilling with the sheep and then, oh, no, a lion's come. Now I need to attack it. Nothing like that. I guarantee you he's out there praying and praising and meditating on the word of God. We can see that in the Psalms, that that's something that he loved to do, thinking about it and processing it and applying it to his life. Like, he's doing this, and it all prepares him for those moments where the sheep get taken away, and he has to go into action. And those moments prepared him for Goliath, and Goliath prepared him to be a king, okay? And so, so we need to pursue intimacy with God. We need to grow close. It's not enough to just think that you're tough, because trust me, you ain't tough enough, plain and simple. And so moving forward, so Saul finally allows David to fight. He says, fine, that's okay, let's do this, but here's what I want to do. We need to arm you up, because David, remember, he's not there as a soldier, he's there as a shepherd, and so he's wearing, you know, just whatever a shepherd's clothes would be. He still reeks of poo, probably. Um, he's stinky, and he's got his staff, and he's got his sling, and he's got his pouch, and, and he's just kind of walking around as a shepherd, and Saul's like, we need to fix this mess, and so he puts a, uh, his armor on David, he loads him up. And, and it, it, the picture that I get whenever um, the Bible says that he puts his armor on David, I picture a little kid wearing his mom or dad's T-shirt. You know what I mean? Like, well, this doesn't fit. Like, first of all, remember, Saul is super tall, right? So he's way taller than David. And not only that, but David's just not used to it. He's not been a warrior. And so everything's clunky and uncomfortable. And he's like, let's take, let's take this off. Like, this isn't working. Well, uh, I read a book about David and Goliath recently, and, and Louis Giglio, who wrote it, basically said that what he thinks, one of the things that Saul was doing in there was he wasn't just trying to protect David. He was actually trying to cover up what he thought were insecurities in David. In other words, if we make you look like a soldier, maybe people won't laugh at us when you go out on the battlefield, right? We need to make you look the part. And David said, look, I'm not comfortable Trying to be you, I'm only comfortable being me and who God has created me to be. And so he takes off the armor, goes out unarmed, wearing nothing but his shepherd stuff, goes out even with his staff. He's just walking out there like he's got some sheep. He finds five smooth stones in a nearby river, puts them in his pouch, and he heads out to the battle. And he walks out to the battle. And it's just such a powerful thing because uh, the reason he was comfortable with who he was is because he was confident in who God is. Now, if you, if you struggle with insecurity, this is something that you need to let sink in because your insecurity isn't there because, uh, because you need to fix yourself. Your insecurity is there is because you may have misplaced your confidence. It's not meant to be in yourself. You will never be perfect, and if you pursue security in yourself, you will never stop struggling with that issue, ever. But when you put your confidence in him, all of a sudden you become comfortable in your own skin. And, and, and David, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the fact that David was a shepherd since we're here, because, because one of the reasons I think um, 
it's so cool that David was a shepherd is because the Bible tells us over and over again that God himself has the heart of a shepherd. And this is significant because the difference between a king with a selfish heart and a shepherd's heart is a selfish king uses his power to get what he wants. Like some of you husbands do. Like some of you bosses do. Like some of you parents do. You use your authority, you exercise it to get what you want out of the situation. Well, that's not what a shepherd does. A shepherd uses his authority to help others, to lead them and bring them to a better place so that we can all come along together. And so so David, who has a shepherd's heart, writes these famous words in Psalm 23. I'm just going to read the whole thing. You need to bookmark this one. If If you're not familiar with it, it's fantastic. And this is what he says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. In other words, God provides everything we need. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his names. He doesn't just provide, he guides. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Do we see that David lived these words? I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. He protects us. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, listen, I don't care who is after you or what is after you or what problem plagues you. David is like, it doesn't matter because God prepares a feast for me, a celebration for me in the presence of everything that would seek to destroy me. That ultimately it will not get to me because he will not allow it to. He says, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely, confidence, your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. David has no reason to be ashamed. He's confident in who God is, and so he's comfortable in who he is. So David goes out to the battlefield. And uh, obviously now everybody gets to see him doing this. And he's, you can just imagine, like, imagine the battle lines like you've seen in movies. There's people with swords and spears, and they're all lined up. And David's kind of wading his way through them. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. You know, like, excuse me, mister. I got to get through here. And he's, he's heading out to the battlefield, and he pushes his way through, and there's the clinking of armor, and you can hear him coming. And he finally gets to the front, and Goliath sees his opponent for the first time in verse 41. It says, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. In other words, he looked like a boy. We believe that he was around 20 at this time, but he's like me, like baby-faced David. You know what I mean? Like he looks 10 years younger than he is, and he's mad. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick, referring to his shepherd's staff. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. Now remember, up to this point, he had just issued a challenge, but these words are a lot stronger than what they were before. And look how David responds. David replied to the Philistine, You come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Woo! Yeah, I don't need to talk about that. Let's keep going. So Goliath moves closer to attack after this speech. And um, David moves in, and they run toward each other, and David pulls a a rock out of his pouch, and he puts it in his sling, which, again, is this is not not just a weapon they use on the battlefield. He has this sling because he's a shepherd. It's to protect from these animals that would attack his sheep. And he pulls this thing out, and he's like, you're just like a big old bear, aren't you? And boom, smacks him right in the forehead, and Goliath falls face down. And one of the things that the, uh, the, the children's version of this story don't tell you 
is that at that point, David ran up to the body of Goliath, and just to make it really, really abundantly clear that God was, uh, was able to conquer this giant, he takes Goliath's own sword out of its sheath, and he lops off Goliath's head. He would later take that head home with him as a trophy, as a reminder that God is faithful. It's not just a gross thing. It's a reminder that God is faithful. And so listen to me. When God helps you through something that you've been praying about or you've been trusting him for, don't you dare walk away from that battlefield without a souvenir. You need to hang that thing up, and then every single time that you're facing a struggle or a stress and you think the enemy's closing in on you, you need to look at it and say, yeah, see, but I know God better than this. You, you are not big enough to defeat my God. After that, the Philistines saw that their champion had died, and especially at the hands of this little boy, and they turned tail and just ran. And guess what happened after that? The Israelites, finally inspired with courage from their true king, chased them down. And everything that David said came to pass. Here's why that ending is so significant. That ending is so significant because it only takes one person sometimes to inspire confidence in thousands of others. One person to step up and say, I believe that God can do anything, that he can't defeat me, that he can't conquer me, that they need to see, the people around you in your life, Christian or not, need to see when you're going through struggles that you have not given up hope because you believe that God will deliver you and they're gonna notice that there's something different about the way that you're living. And that one little act inspired all this confidence and they came rushing forward. That finally, the truth that David knew by looking through that filter of faith, they were finally able to apply it to their own lives. And my question for you is, have you applied it to your own? Have you been, have you been wearing the armor? Have you been trying to look the part, coming in here, you know, talking to people, maybe reading your Bible, maybe praying, just trying to look the part? but never really willing to step out in faith, never seeing the world through the right filter or the way that you ought to. I want you to know something that's really, really amazing that uh, Louis Giglio points out in his book. It's called Goliath Must Fall. One of the biggest premises in the entire book is the fact that when we look at the story of David and Goliath, we think that we're David, but the truth is we're not David. Jesus is David. That it was his act of bravery and courage and confidence in his father in going to the cross in attacking the enemy head on that is the reason that we can now live confidently and ferociously in our own lives see you may not understand it but i want you to know right up front that jesus himself called himself the good shepherd this is what he said this is john chapter 10 verses 14 and 15 he said I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. The same way that David defeated, defeated Goliath is the same way that you overcome your greatest enemy, which we haven't even talked about yet. There is a giant in your life that no matter how practical or pragmatic or confident in yourself you are, that you will never be able to overcome on your own. And that problem is your sin. Your sin. That, that by failing to follow and obey God with your life, that you have essentially set yourself on a course for destruction, for ruin, that to live in fear and to live in worry because one day, Death is going to catch up with you. And all the stuff that you've tried, all the good works and the things you thought would qualify you for heaven, you'll realize that it's simply not enough. But the truth is that Jesus, being the greater David, not only went to battle for us, but he gave himself up for us. But here's the beautiful thing, that even death couldn't hold him in the grave. Wasn't enough. Wasn't enough to keep him down. 
And if it wasn't enough to keep him down, it wasn't enough to keep you down either. If you only put your faith and your trust in him, Jesus will forgive you and he will raise you up with him. He will give you the strength and the confidence that you need to make it through anything, anything, if you will only trust him. And so if you'll stand, I'm going to give you an opportunity for those of you who don't know him to come to know him. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. In a few minutes, we're going to give. Stick around. Do not leave this room because I love you and we need to give glory to God. But if you could close your eyes just for a moment, I want to give people an opportunity. First of all, to you believers, for those of you that follow Jesus, that put your trust in him, I've got a question. Who among you needs to reset and put your confidence and trust back in God and off of whatever you've been trusting. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I just invite you right now to raise your hand up and say, I've been trusting the wrong things. I want to trust in God. I want to know that I can overcome anything because he is the one who truly overcomes for me. Put your hand up. My hand's up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's return to him and put our trust and confidence back in him. It takes away fear. It takes away worry. It takes away all these things. Hands up all over. I'm going to pray for you in just a minute. Put your hands down. The other group of people I want to talk to is the group in here that doesn't know that they're forgiven. That their eternity is not sure in their mind. That heaven is going to be a reality for them. That they've been struggling and striving on their own strength and it just hasn't been enough. If that's you, I want you to know that Jesus loved you enough to die for you. And he died so that you could live. He doesn't want you to earn it. He doesn't want you to struggle for it. He just wants you to believe that he did that for you. If today you're sitting there and as I'm talking, God is stirring up things in your heart. He's stirring up a faith in you. You're thinking, I believe this. I believe in Jesus. I want to put my trust in him today. If that's you and you were putting your faith in him today, Put your hand up so we can pray for you. Who would say, I need Jesus today? I see your hand back there. I see you, buddy. Anybody else? I need to be forgiven. I need to put my trust in him. Anybody else? That God's stirring your heart and saying, I need Jesus in my life. Let me pray for all of you. Father, we come to you right now. I just thank you for your outlandish love for us. I thank you for the story of David and Goliath that inspire so much confidence and courage in us, but not because of who we are, but because of who you are. I pray for all of those who said, I need to reroute my trust back to Jesus. I pray that you would help them to do that consistently day after day. I pray that you would help them to not grow in toughness, but to grow in intimacy with you, knowing that you are the one who makes us truly tough to overcome any obstacle that comes our way. And God, I pray also for those who said, I need Jesus in my life. I pray that you would put them, put inside their hearts a real, true, deep, abiding faith. God, help them to know you and to know that as they grow, that sometimes it's hard. It's hard to understand and it's hard to believe everything that we, we hear from you. But God, I pray that you would help them to know that as long as they cling to the fact that there is a God who loved them so much he died for them, that everything's going to be just fine. I pray that you would be with us during this time of worship, God, that you would bless us and fill us with your love. We love you, Lord, so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Let's worship. Boy.